Hey guys, Dylan Hartley here. This week on the England Rugby Podcast with O2 Inside Line, we've got Mara Toje and Benno Abano. How are you feeling about the tournament so far, Maz? What, what's going on? How are you feeling? Uh, well, obviously results haven't gone our way so far. Um, so, you know, there's you know there's lots of work for us to do in that department. And, you know, there's a lot of work still to come with the two big games coming up. But in terms of being in the group, you know, I've thoroughly enjoyed being part of this England team. Results haven't gone our way, but I still feel as if this team is going places. You know, I think, you know, you, you were involved probably the last time we had a bit of a tough period like this in 2018. And I think we used that as a period to propel us to go and, to the next level. And I think that's what this period is going to be. I think um, obviously it's been a bit sticky so far, but I genuinely believe this team is still going in the right direction. Yeah, decent. Um, <laughs> it's funny with uh, people like, oh yeah, you, you, were, you were so, you know, 2016, 2017. And I, I never mentioned 2018 in my CV. It's just like a uh, kind of like mumble or murmur that one. Um, but but I agree with you that like that campaign led to um, it was almost like a springboard for your guys' success in, in 2019. What about getting home, Benno? Good good to mentally refresh. Um, did you go back and play? Yeah, I went back and played. How, how so was like, that in terms of change of scenery? Yeah, it was actually fine. It was actually like quite nice. Um, it sort of gave me one. You know, when you have these weeks off, your weeks sometimes lose a little bit of structure. Um, to go back and play, I had like a nice structure and I could just follow and get my training in and go and play with the boys. So I kind of liked it. It was actually pretty decent for me. Eddie gave me the choice and was like, you can go and play if you want to. The choice? Do you want to play? Choice. It's like a rhetorical question, that one. Yeah. <laughs> we, we talked about this with Mako and um, Joe Marler about like the um, that, that same question that comes of extra fitness after a game, if you've only played like 20, 30 minutes, like, do you want to do a bit? It's like, there's only one answer. Oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you going to um, say? No. How how was it going back? You know, like you, you could easily easily use the excuse of you've obviously been in camp and you got to go back to the club and your routine's a little bit out. You got to pick up new lineout calls. You got to fit back into a different system, a different structure, a different way of playing. How was it, or was it easy to just go back and play? You know, did you just take the shackles off and, and give it a crack? It wasn't easy as such, like because you 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 would definitely know what it's like when you have to go back from. Like, I never got sent home, mate. <laughs> well at the end of the tournament after you'd won the tournament right you had to go oh, back yeah, yeah, you know yeah, slack, that's, right? yeah that's that's it yeah yeah after, after yeah, yeah after all the awards you had to go back to no awards Benno, Benno, no awards no awards <laughs> but no i no i can relate in terms of um finishing a tournament going back and um trying to adapt to how your club plays that, that's my yeah. question to you how, how was it it was actually all right. Like I kind of like find motivation in the fact that it's supposed to be quite awkward and quite difficult, um, and like find the motivation to like try and alleviate that in a sense. So I actually enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. Like it was sort of something different that I hadn't done in like two three months now. So it was actually quite nice. And and I went back. That was like the first time I'd gone back and played for Bath after I'd played for England. So it was actually like yeah, I, I kind of liked it. Good. You go well. I thought I went all right. I went, I, yeah, I thought I went all right. Maz, what about you? Just like men mentally, because this tournament's a, a, a long tournament, eh? Like um, th my experience is it's like, it's almost like three months, the tournament with your fellow weeks in and the, the pre-training the week beforehand. Is it good to be able to get home? I thought it was good. I thought it was, it was nice to be able to mentally refresh a little bit. Um, and probably even more so at the moment than usual Six Nations campaigns because of the nature of the bubble. Um, like normally, you know, throughout the week, you can find times to go out into Twickenham for a coffee or go out and um, have dinner out one night, et cetera, et cetera. But given the, given, you know, the reality of where we are with, with COVID, all that stuff is is not is not feasible. So we're much more intensely in a bubble, 
and just having that extra bit of time at home was I think has given a lot of people myself included that time to just be a bit more um, mentally refreshed going into you know these next two weeks. Nice without um, prying too much what's at home for you? Uh, my brother lives with me um, and I also have one of my teammates housemates and friends uh, Rosemi Shegun who, who lives with me as well so there's three of us in the house um, and it's you know it's, it's, it's a nice nice little spot got, got a little garden got a little fishes to keep me company uh, I've, I've I've gone into my fish um, in my old age so um, are we yeah, talking sure like that... outdoor pond fish or indoor aquarium like out, out, outdoor outdoor fish what what sort of fish if you're into your fish tell me about your fish uh, so I've got sturgeon I've got a few a few uh, Koi, koi fish, I have a butterfly, butterfly koi fish, I have a gold, gold ghost koi fish, a couple blue offs, a couple goldfish, uh, a couple shabunkans. Shabunkans? <laughs> shabunkans. Uh, what else have I got? Yeah, so I've got, I've got a, f- a fair few. But you know, it sounds like he's got too much money. Yeah, but like, you've got a pond in buying... your back garden, isn't it? That's different. That's different. <laughs> <laughs> Koi carp, eh? Who, who would have known? I want to talk to you, Bino. Um, obviously, for you, this is all kinds of new, obviously, coming into camp. what? How have you found that sort of extra level of being an England player? My sort of transition to camp has been, like, quite, like, gradual. Because, obviously, the first time I was in was, like, what, 2018? 2018, and then, yeah. And then it's been, like... From then, it was, like, real tough back then. And then it, I'd say it got a little bit easier at the end of 2018. And then obviously I got hurt and that was tough for me again. And then now I think I did a lot between that period and now. And it's tough, but like, it's a challenge. It's not like tough that you can't do it. It's tough and you can do it and you can do it better and better and just like keep working it. So it's it's been like enjoyable, I think, um, for me. So cast yourself back to Brighton 2018. You obviously get called in. And um, you don't you don't obviously think you've made it, but like you're going to for that big step up. What did you kind of see, learn, and feel from that first experience? Because I, I read something that you you left that thinking that you weren't quite ready after seeing that environment. Am I right? Yeah, hundred like like cause I've seen players like play and they play once and they don't play again. You know, so it was sort of like in in a sense it was sort of like a little bit of a blessing in disguise because. I don't feel like I was ready to like go and dominate. Do you know what I mean? I could have probably like survived, um, but you're not out there to survive. You're out there to like be the best, right? So um, that at that point, I don't think I could have like dominated. Whilst like now, I feel like I'm in more of that position to do that. It's just like a, a sort of like tough environment that you have to be constantly on for. Um, like obviously, I've done my little bits, but this is like the longest period of, other than the autumn. This is this is like the longest period I've done. So it's sort of like you have to realise how like on you have to be constantly to, to improve. There's no like you have to literally like schedule your downtime, if that makes sense, to like recover so you can be on and be on well. And those that's probably like one of the biggest things I've learned while I've been here, how how much you have to do that to make sure you can perform when it's time to perform. And performing isn't just a Saturday. Like you have to perform in the week in order to then perform on Saturday as well. So that was quite a big thing. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting point. And I think um, there's a lot of people that probably listen and view general rugby fans, just think like you guys do a bit of training and you got a lot of downtime, but you guys are literally on from, you know, seven to seven. And when you're in camp, you're on from seven to 10, you know, Maz, I know the work that you put in with um, analysis and kind of preparing lineup menus and stuff like that. You're accessible the whole time. And do you know what? I reckon, you know, six nations camp was a bubble before a bubble was a thing. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like rugby tours, rugby camps, you know, you guys are used to living in bubbles. And I think um, what you just touched on there, Benno, is you're always accessible. There's no get in the car, drive home, switch off. Like you're always there. You're always on. Uh, Beno, going to your first cap, um, you know, first cap experiences these days during COVID must be different, um, but still uh, an amazing achievement um, by any individual. But like, how did you, how did you celebrate that one? 
Um, I know Maz kind of done a bit of a whip around and got some uh, some video messages and apparently there's a, a good video of your mum going kind of crazy <laughs> when, when you got your first cap. Um, how was that for you? How was your first experience uh, at international rugby? So like everyone's always like, oh, how is it with like no fans and stuff? And like, I won't lie to you, like building up to the game, a part of me was kind of glad because I'd have to be trying to get tickets from God knows where to get like everybody there. Um, and you got like your like my whole family, extended family and friends have obviously been waiting for a while and everyone would want to be there. So I think that was like a little blessing in the skies, but I would have just loved to see my parents as well. That would have been nice um, to, to have seen them. I think they would have loved it probably more than I would have. So that was cool, but probably, it was probably like a few days afterwards, like when I spoke to my mum, um, when I spoke to my mum's and she was just like, I'm really proud of you and that, because they don't really say that. My parents, my parents always say I'm proud of you. Like I, I don't. So when when she said that to me, I was like, oh, rah, like okay, moms, thank you, innit? So <laughs> I guess that that they must. And then when I when I went back home and stuff, so when I when I went back home, like people were like my neighbors are coming out their house to say like, oh, congratulations, and I'm like, rah, go on. So I guess it it sort of put like everything into perspective and was like, rah, like this was actually something pretty cool, Ben's. Like um, these people that don't watch rugby coming out of the house to congratulate you about what you've done so that was yeah that was cool that's cool i think if there's ever a time for parents to say that they're proud of um their son playing international rugby i think that's the the time yeah that's probably a good um, first time to start in it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you like when i look at your career Maz, it just seems like it's, it's it's rolled in glory like it's just winning 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 but like have you had any steep learnings that you can remember from when you were like a young guy coming into that international environment? I um I, I think I've had a lot of learnings along the way. I remember my first line out session at, at the club at Saracens. Uh, back then, um, you know, Steve Borthwick was was still playing and it was Steve, George, Moritz Botha, etc. And I came throughout my, you know, age grade school level thinking I was like some line out phenom who could like compete with, with, with could, like could dominate anyone. Then I went and <clears throat> I went into that session and I literally, I was jumping, the left was throwing me, I couldn't hold my shape. I couldn't get anywhere near Steve or George or Mo. I was like, wow, I actually got some work to do. Then again, when I came into, cause I, I came into, my first camp was the 2015 and, you know, I came in and I was like, even just doing like fitness and doing, we didn't really do too much rugby whilst I was there, but, you know, I realised then, okay, yeah, that is a bit of a gap between me and, you know, my competitors. And I suppose I've, I've, I've learned, I've learned it in, in different ways. Obviously I've, I've probably played a bit more than, some people my age but I've learned it I've, I've, I think I've learned through experiences of things not going well or things not going all right so I, you know going back to going back to that 2018 period you know, I think I learned loads from from that um, and this period that we're going through at the moment um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm learning like loads again about 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 myself and how I can get better and how I can, you know, push it. So, you know, we thank God for the for the for the for the positives and and the you know perceived glory. But it's uh, I think there's a, there's still lessons within 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 those those periods. What what about in like 2016? You you obviously got capped um, against Italy, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, I remember there's loads of noise around you pre that tournament, and it was almost like Eddie was doing his thing, like. Eddie will pick Mauro when he's when Eddie wants to. He wasn't going to like follow the media narrative. But when you finally stepped onto that field and you you played a game and you finished a, a campaign in the tournament, how did you feel? Did did you go? I've arrived, or you know, did that just kind of scratch the itch and, and you wanted to improve and kick on from there? If I want to be brutally honest, um, I probably don't think I I don't think I was probably ready in. In 2015, when I was in the mix, you know, I was desperate for an opportunity. So I guess we'll, we'll never really know. But, you know, I don't know if I was fully ready for the heat of international rugby. But by that Six Nations, I think I was definitely ready. I think I was definitely ready to, you know, to put my best foot forward and 
you know, I was definitely ready to, um, you know, make an impact. So when, when it, so I, I wouldn't use the word comfortable because like, you know, being in this environment, you're never really comfortable. Um, so I wasn't comfortable, but I, I felt as if, you know, I could stand up and put my hand up and for it to be counted. Yeah, everything happens for a reason. I think timing's uh, time is key in a lot of things and missing out on 2015 was probably a good thing for you because you, you basically came into a team that was rejuvenated and uh, we obviously went on a nice little run there. 18 games unbeaten internationally. But um, looking at my stats, I think you played 27 games, club and country, like undefeated. Like that is a dream start. Um, what What's that like as a young player? Um, don't worry, Ben. I'm coming to you about your your start as well. we'll I, I, ain't that. That. I ain't won that. I ain't won that, man. Don't, don't compare me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it was amazing. First and foremost, I think it was amazing to be part of you know two very successful teams. And you know, as a young person, you I think you're almost fooled a little bit because you start playing you know proper senior rugby, and you just don't. You're just not losing so you think that it's everything is easy and don't get me wrong like you know I trained hard I worked hard I was you know I contributed to you know two very successful teams but you kind of think oh this is how it was always meant to be this is how it's like this is how it's supposed to happen so in terms of a start it was, it was probably like a dream start but you know I think probably when it it, it ended it made me realize of you know actual all the hard work it actually takes to get in that position or and all the hard work it takes and the mentality that you have to have as a team um as well as an individual to to have to, to be in that position yeah and um, it's funny because like like winnings that for me winning is why i played you know i loved winning i'm a competitor i loved competing in just about everything and for me, winning was that. But like, I reckon my best lessons or like the hardest learnings are always off a loss or for me, disciplinary or injury. You know, like that's where you learn about yourself, not not as just a sports person, but as like as a person, you know, like you've got to dig deep. That's where you really work things out. Yeah, it's um, through, through adversity. Um, like when you, when you go through tough periods, you you kind of figure out who you really are, uh, you know, people's true colors, people's, you know, natural behaviors come out when, when things aren't, aren't going well. So I think you learn a lot about yourself, but you also learn a lot about, you know, the people around you and how you can either motivate or get other people back on track. Like, Touching on that it, point, sorry. I know come you're on in, questions, but I just thought, um, but do you not find it difficult, like, when you're winning to not, like, become stagnant as well? Like, I find that a little bit, like, I think it's easier to chase something, like, um, so, like, if you're down or, like, you've lost, it's like you're chasing, you're chasing your win. When you're winning and you've won for a period of time, I would have thought to stay on top's a little bit more difficult, like, just yeah. conversely. Yeah, yeah. I, and do you know what? I think we experienced that. So 2016, we were flying. 2017, we we're flying. Then 2018, like, where did we go from there? And we had to change, but we kept doing what we'd been doing to mm. be successful. But then every team in the Northern Hemisphere, well, and South, were kind of playing us. And we had a big old bullseye, not on our backs. It was on our forehead. And everyone was watching us, you know, forensically analyzing our game. And we were talked about. And all of a sudden, we have a slump like we did in 2018. But my experience looking back at that, we revisited some fundamentals in our game, like the breakdown, for example. I remember playing at Scotland and we got pulled apart at the breakdown. So we went away and worked on that for the rest of 2018. And then, you know, the Mara and the team success in 2019 was off the back of that year. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, experience is a, is a great teacher. You know, you've got to, and that's why, like, you've got to respect the teams that are constantly consistently at number one in, in whatever sort of sport or or any sort of sector or walk of life people that remain at the top are always reinventing themselves and staying ahead of the curve and we come on to your guys family ties so for for people that are listening or, or watching you guys are actual cousins right three days apart 
Three days yeah. apart. Benno Who's the senior? Three days older than me. Benno. The boss man. Yeah. Hey, Benno's got can... more money, but I'm the adult, you see. <laughs> can I ask, is, is there anything like really interesting in Nigerian culture? Like, um, you know, in Tongan culture, uh, Mako and Bully. Like, whatever Mako says, Bully has to do. Is that the same in Nigerian culture or not? So Nigerian culture is very hierarchical. Um, it's very much like the senior is the uh, is is the boss. Like, for example, like if we were here now and there's two chairs, let's have two chairs here. Let's say Benno was in in a chair and I was in a chair. And let's say our parents walk in, like we would both be expected to get up, like without even if they, they have to like literally fight us to stay on the seat um like very big on like greeting like if you don't if i don't greet you in a specific manner or that they deem appropriate then it's seen as a big disrespect so that is very hierarchical in terms of age and the juniors just answered for the senior i like that <laughs> you don't have to talk too much when you're the big one <laughs> <laughs> well, tell, tell me about like um Tell me about growing up um, with you two. Were you kind of just like uh, in the back garden at barbecues, kind of running it straight at each other? Or, you know, it was a rugby ball <laughs> present? <laughs> running it straight. <laughs> but but no, doesn't want it straight at me now. He didn't do it back then. He still doesn't want to do it now. So. <laughs> Bro, no, you love to talk crud on these podcasts, isn't it? <laughs> this is not how it goes down. You like to talk like this on this podcast, isn't it? Better doesn't do it now, bro. I've, I've been waiting. I've been waiting for you, better to you try. Know I'll pull up evidence and I'll give you evidence. I'll give you a lot of evidence. Sometime, evidence. Isn't it? I'll give them evidence, bro. Bro, show me the evidence. Ben, so I'll, just okay, I'll give you They'll the take evidence. it out of court. They'll throw it out. Okay, okay, okay. okay um, can, can we answer the question, though? Like, growing <laughs> up, what was, was there rugby ball, like, around? Were you, you guys, was rugby a thing in the family growing up? Did you guys... Yeah, did you run it straight in the garden? Was it on? No. Um, I don't know if we ever really spoke about rugby when we were younger. Yeah, like, um, we, we, we both come from, you know, family slash culture where rugby wasn't a thing. Like, our parents never planned for us to both be professional rugby players. You know, rugby is a very, you know my new shy sport in Nigerian culture is, is, a, is a sport that a lot of people don't actually know in Nigeria. So there was like, mo like Benno and I, our families have been on holidays together. We've been, you know, we spent, we spent pretty much nearly every Christmas together. Um, our parents are, 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 you know, very close with one another. Um, our parents are actually with each other at the moment in Nigeria. Um, so, you know, we, we, we spent a lot of time both together and with our families, um, but it was never really about rugby. Yeah, it was never really about rugby. It was about just, you know, just what young young boys, young men were up to. It was never really about rugby. Yeah, just vibes. Okay, okay, so if it wasn't rugby, Benno, what was it? Give me an early memory about Mara. Have you guys been competitive against with each other? Not really. Mara was a little bit quieter, I would say, like. He's played FIFA quite a bit. I don't know if I slapped him up or not. Probably did. What What about like um in terms of sporting icons or role models? Then, if rugby wasn't like a thing, what What for you, Benno, was like your pin up? Who Who was the man like that you aspired to be like? What sport was it? Probably football. Like I, I really liked Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank when I was um younger. Just like the way he played and stuff. So, what about you, then, man? Has you got any? What, what's an early early memory of Benno? Early um, he liked he liked his food. <laughs> he liked his food, but I was always uh, this is the slimmest you've ever seen. Better, <laughs> better. <laughs> liked his food. Liked to eat. He liked liked his music as well. He was he had an alternative career back in the day, um, so he liked his music. <laughs> um, he, he liked he liked to dance as well. He liked to dance. He liked to dance. And he actually, he loved, he, he did genuinely love football. For for a period of time, I think he would have definitely preferred to play football rather than rugby. What, what, okay, so what about you then, Mez, in terms of sport and kind of uh, people you idolised and people you aspired to be like? Was, was rugby on the radar? So rugby wasn't on the radar up until I moved to secondary school, to be honest. 
um, up until that point, the the type of people that I looked up to was so I I'm I'm, I'm from North London um, and I was I was an Arsenal Arsenal fan, so you know that's when Arsenal were really Arsenal. So the likes of Thierry Henry, Patrick Vieira, um, you know those were the guys that I I really loved and adored. But <clears throat> besides that, um, probably one of my biggest sporting idols growing up was uh, um, Muhammad Ali. Um, you know, I've, my dad first told me about Muhammad Ali in a car journey. I don't even know where we're going, but it was a long car journey. And ever since that that day, I was infatuated by the, by the man. Um, so I'll probably say um, Muhammad Ali. Have you ever dabbled in a bit of boxing? Only a little bit of training, nothing, nothing too serious. Um, but just a little bit of training here and there. Sink loves it, eh? Like Bin, yeah, Binny quite... Tio used to love, like, Binny Tio would prefer to do conditioning at the side of the field, just doing boxing training, rather than doing rugby stuff, 100%. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a few boys here who's still, who's still on it, like Stu, Will Stewart is on it, Ellis Genge, a bit of Sink, Faz does a bit as well. What about, like, both of you guys are quite interesting, eh? Sinny, the rapper. Tell me, You're retired. The rapper's retired, you know. Okay, no, no, but you've got you've got that in, you've got it on the CV. Producer, director, rugby player, dancer, fashionista, Maru, poet, politician, student, fishman. Like, <laughs> where, 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 where's this come from? That like you guys with all your other interests and your sort of drive outside of the game. Like, where, where's that come from for you, Benno? I think there's like an element of like. One, one actually, I think it comes from the idea that like your parents are always like, you have to have a backup plan um, for one. I think that's like where like the ethos sort of stems from. And secondly, I think it comes from the idea that I think my parents wanted us to be like well-rounded people. So they sort of put you in loads of different things as like a youngster. So when you do loads of different like stuff, your, your mind is used to doing more than one thing. So when it comes to now to play rugby, it's sort of like, ah, oh, but we usually do a lot of stuff when I was younger. Do you know what I mean? I didn't just do one thing. So the idea that now I do more stuff and you try and elevate that alongside the idea that you have to have a backup plan when, if rugby was to ever go wrong or when you do retire, it's sort of like those elements put together just like makes you do more things, I think. And then you you actually find out that you actually like it. Like I, I, I go to uni to study like sports psychology just more so like I can do something after rugby and then you're like, oh, I actually enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? So it's sort of, that's what, what about to it. What about like you talking about a backup plan? Has, has the backup plan focusing on that or, you know, balance as you call it, has it ever taken your focus away from plan A? Nah, so like my parents wanted me to go to uni when I came straight out of school and I sort of refused um, because I wanted to just focus on rugby and get that right and then... I was speaking to some people the other day and it sort of gets to the point in your career, like now I know what I need to do in a week to get right. Um, or I have a strong idea. So like, I know my pockets of time in which I can use to do other things. Cause I know what I need to do to get right for the weekend or I know what I need to do to get right to train. So it's sort of like where I have like areas of free time cause you will have them. Then I just like plug that with something else basically. It's, it's good. It's, it's, it's nice to hear. It's, it's impressive. What about you, Maz? Where, where's it come from? Um, so I would say a little bit, you know, similar. Um, there's definitely a family slash cultural thing in regards to that. To that, like my, my parents have always been massive on education, and when I was leaving school, it was it was almost like a non-negotiable for, for me. Um, I had to, I had to study, um, but I, I enjoyed it. And what I found was that it made me enjoy my rugby time more. Um, so me, you know, jumping on a train um, for an hour to get into, get into my uni, then having a two hour lecture, then jumping on the train to go back. That period actually made me like, oh, the rugby, this, the rugby part is actually fun. The rugby part is what, you know, what I want to be doing. So it made me like cherish and make the most of my time when I was in, in those in those moments. And I think now it's more, you know, I think there's an element of it, which is planning for post-career. Um, I think that's an element of it. 
but I've, I've got a curious mind. Um, I've got a curious mind and I, I need to be, it needs to be, you know, fully activated. You know, I, I get, I get bored very, very quickly. And, um, you know, I think I just need the, I need to keep busy for, for my mind to be, you know, satisfied. That's good. Um, and you, to hear you say it makes your rugby stronger or, you know, your rugby time better or, or more appreciated is good to hear. But like, in terms of your curiosity, what what is what is your curiosity at the moment? Is it study? Is it poetry? Is it, uh, I saw the um, the divide. Um, please tell me what it was. Uh, digital divide, yeah. Digital divide, thank you. Yeah. Um, what What's your kind of key focus at the moment? How do you, how do you manage your time? Because like, I know when you start spending some plays, all of a sudden you take your off the ball at rugby and, mm. and, you know, if you're doing a million things at once, you know, they're not all being done well. Um, what, what's your thing at the moment? Whatever I do, whether it's, uh, you know, wh whether it's, you know, studying, whether it's, you know, you know other campaigning, etc. cetera, um, the craft is the craft and the craft is always the most important thing. So whatever I do never compromises my rugby. Um, I will never... I would never, you know, oh, oh, can I leave training early because I need to get to this? Or, oh, okay, I'm not meant to, I have this on later, so let me just cut this session short. That type of uh, conversation or that type of thought process doesn't go through my mind. Like, because, because of rugby, I'm able to do a lot more things. And, you know, you know, rugby has given me so many opportunities. And, you know, I think you have to respect that and respect the position that rugby has put me in. So the craft is the craft and you must always focus on the craft. So the, so rugby is always numero uno. Rugby is always, always number one and everything else kind of just fits in alongside of that because you do have not, you do, like everyone, like I think in life, I think you make time for the things that you think are important. If you think something is really important, even if you have a full schedule, if you have a full schedule and you think something is really important, you'll make time for it. So and that's the way I kind of see my me balancing everything. Like the rugby is the rugby and that is a non-negotiable and that is what I will always prioritise as long as I'm a professional rugby player. But the, all the other things... Like there's enough downtime to to get it done if you so wish. If you don't think it's important, then you don't make time for it. But if you do think it's important, you will make time for it because, you know, in camp is a little bit different because of the intensity of 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 of, of camp life. Um, but especially when you're in normal club club mode slash off season slash you know, a week off, you do have time to. You do have time to, you know, look at other things and, you know, be interested in and make things happen in other areas. The craft, very wise, Maz. I'm just trying to work out what my craft is. No. <laughs> and um, we're right at this thing, isn't it? Nah, I'm, I'm going to get some tips off Mara in a second about podcasting because you're obviously hosting your your, your own. But um, Nando is obviously very important to you, Maz, because you're a good 50 minutes late for us tonight. Um, we always got to make time for food, which I fully agree with. Um, tell me about your podcast. Is that kind of like an escapism type thing? Or is that more of life after rugby? What What is that for you? The podcast Pearl Conversations by Mario Toje um, was, uh, it was, it was born so out of Apple music. And <laughs> <laughs> um, it was born out of the first lockdown really at that point things were actually getting a bit quiet for me um I wasn't studying I wasn't um obviously rugby stopped completely so training time was was a bit limited and you know I still wanted to use that time to be productive in one way shape or another so I kind of decided that I, I would do a podcast and pretty much just talk to people that I find interesting and just have a conversation about, you know, their area slash field, field of expertise and use it of a way for, of me learning about them, me learning and understanding a different perspective. And that's why I wanted it to be as, you know, wide and as broad as, as I possibly could. It wasn't just 
sports podcast. It wasn't just athletes. It was, you know, I had athletes, I had models, I had politicians, I had businessmen, I had social activists. Um, so for me, it was just about, again, I think trying to feed the curiosity and, you know, learning and just trying to be as busy and as, you know, productive as possible with, with the time I had. Cool. Should I um should I wait for my call for series two? Oh well, yeah, you, you got you got an expensive invoice still, bro. We, no, we, I tried do, to I re- we tried to reach your agent, bro. You, they gave us a big bill, Come you on, know. Man. So Bino, I'm gonna give you a chance now. You can plug away, mate. Amazon Prime, talk to me about it. Let's go. I really liked it, everybody's game. Honestly, it was it was Yes, you like it. I love do you know why I liked it? It was great to see like someone got off the backside uh, yourself and, and did something really good. Um, yeah so, so yeah to tell, tell us about it it all started like a few years ago actually i remember speaking to mara about it. i was like bro i want to do this um this documentary on like this sort of thing but at the time it was sort of like an idea and what i've noticed with ideas is like the what actually starts and where it actually finishes is like quite different you have like a idea or like a philosophy of what you want to do or the message you want to promote but like how you're going to do it you haven't actually filled in the blanks yet And so I had the idea about like a good few years ago and I happened to just like bump into this production company and I mentioned they wanted to like do some sort of like rugby work. And I was like, bro, I've got this documentary that I want to do. What are your thoughts on this? So I then I I, I talked to them about the idea. And even at this time, we still didn't fully know how we were going to do it. So we must have shot myself and then we did my parents because I wanted to put people's parents in. But then it's difficult getting players' parents in plus the players and telling people you want to do a documentary and you want to put it on like Netflix or Amazon Prime. People are like, yeah, of course. Um, so obviously at the beginning, it's hard to convince people. Um, so Because the five people that are in there weren't only going to be the only five. There were other people, but they just said no to me, basically. So obviously at this time, we did that. And then the first two shots we did, the first two like shoot we did we didn't even use any of that footage but then lockdown came thank god so lockdown came and it was like okay we've got a period of time here we can really like hash this up and then i went boom i called mara i was like mara can i come down and shoot um in your back garden basically so i did that and then i called b on the way b wasn't actually initially meant to be in it i was just like i think b might be good for this let's just get him in and see if he says anything good and he was actually real good in the end and then we shot Genji like the same week and Anthony the same week. And then the production stuff then happened all after that. But like the in- the first interview from Maro's one to-, to Genji's one, the last one was like so different because you learn so much each time you're doing it. And yeah, it was just like a whole big process and it was good fun. A question for you both then. Oh, I'll come to you, Maro. How-, how can we make sure that rugby is more accessible and that more kids from, from every background know that rugby is out there and can offer them the experiences and the opportunities that we've all had? So rugby in this country is is not the dominant sport. Um, it's quite it's quite a way behind football. And, you know, we all want to increase the amount of rugby that's being played in schools, etc. cetera. The RFU want to do that. You know, I'm sure all the premiership clubs want to do that. So for that to be done, rugby actually has to do more than other sports to reach a wider audience. They have to, you know, cast their net wider and further and reach into communities that aren't typically associated with rugby to try and get them into the sport. And how how it it can be done, I think it's gonna gonna have to be led, you know, from, from the top, from, you know, the RFU premiership, the premiership rugby clubs, looking to actually get into these communities that aren't stereotypically rugby communities. Um, I think they need to have outreach programs to try and capture um, a wider net because, you know, and having a wider net to, for, uh, for different communities different, from different backgrounds to come into the rugby will ultimately, will ultimately lead to a better game overall. It'll be, you know, a wider pool of players, therefore more competitive, um, you know, wider selection for people to choose from, more people playing rugby, revenues go up, uh, more interest in the game, TV money goes up. 
So I think it's in the benefit for, for all. Beno, what, what about you? Like, I, I remember I read that you basically wanted to just tell it how it is. You didn't want to say it was anyone's fault. But but what is the solution then? Like, how, how do we go about that? Like, you, you say, Maz, you talk about, like, casting the net wider. But what is the solution? Like, you obviously put this out there and, you know, people watch it. But what is the solution? Like, what what's something going forward that can be done to kind of capture these kids. Yeah, you know, when, when I say capture, I don't mean going around with nets capturing kids, you know what I mean? Yeah. But capture their imaginations, inspire, aspire. Like, because both of you, um, you know, as kids, didn't look to rugby players as as role models, you know what I mean? I grew up in New Zealand where rugby was rammed down my throat. I had no other option, you know what I mean? But you guys both, both North London? I'm South East London. What is the solution for us, Beno? Like, what, what can be done? You have to have people at the top of the game from non-traditional backgrounds and be seen as sort of role models for one for a better word. And at the lowest level, you have to introduce the sport as well to them. You can't have one without the other because if you just introduce the sport to people, people are like, okay, play it, this is fun. But like the only reason why certain people play football as children is because football is the dominant sport. It's like children are impressionable. You just follow what is deemed as cool. Therefore, if you have people at the top of the game who are deemed as cool and they play rugby, it's like, oh, we could then follow and play rugby as well. And that could be our path. So I think like there's there's two elements to it. You've got to introduce it to those people and then the people at the top of the game have to be of non-traditional backgrounds or have to have come from maybe a different way of playing rugby to encourage younger people to, to get involved. What about like... For, for you guys, was it school that got you to rugby? Like uh, Dulwich College for, for you, Benno? Is that when you picked up the ball? So I went to Dulwich for sixth form. I, I went to um, a good a good Catholic state school in, in, in London and they played rugby and they were like, oh, so I refused to play at the beginning and obviously, and the headmaster was like, you said you would contribute to school life and then I played rugby and I did all right in it. So it was like then I just continued through that path, really. You're massive, mate. You were probably skipping kids for fun. <laughs> I've seen the footage. I've seen the footage. Um, Maz, you, you went to Harrow, right? Uh, again, I went to Harrow for sixth form. I went to... Uh... You were at school. With, did you go... Were you the same... You're younger than 40 and Faz, right? Yeah, so when I was... Yeah, so I've, I've known Faz since I was 11. Um, Faz was... Uh, he, he was in year ten when I was when I was in year seven. So um, you know, Faz was there. I missed forty. I think I joined the year after forty left. So I missed I missed forty. But um, I was you know if you saw if you saw the Faz train from from right from oh was he a big name um, at school was ah uh, he had he had bright Justin Bieber blonde hair at school. Um, I, everyone did. It wasn't just him, or, or the or the white people did anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, he was at school. It was you know, there's no, there's literally no surprise. Um, Faz is you know the, the man slash person he is today. Because even looking back at school, it was it was very clear to see. So you obviously you started playing there, so that was your route to rugby. So what I'm what I'm kind of thinking of, like schools are doing their part and picking up numbers. But what about like clubs? Like, did you guys have access to club rugby where you live? I would I would actually argue it's 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 the other way around. I would actually say clubs. Um, you know, I think clubs are are probably doing better than schools than than introducing people to rugby because it's, it's a very it's, it's a very certain type of school that plays rugby um for the for the most part obviously there are exceptions but you know it's it, it's i i would say that you know a lot of in a lot of communities where rugby isn't a thing the schools don't play rugby or they don't take it seriously at all maybe it's a pe lesson rather than in the sport that they play in in their schools so I would argue that in, if, if we're talking about reaching the type of communities that we want to reach then you know we need to get rugby into those schools that 
you know, aren't traditionally in rugby areas or aren't traditionally rugby schools or all have, you know, a, you know, a large community that aren't necessarily rugby focused. Because I think, you know, they're, they're the schools that are alien, alien to rugby. Uh, we're going to wrap this up and get you boys off the bed. Thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Cheers, Dills. <laughs>